Yo, this is Alex Mouth for Destiny, and today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Sean G. Gumby Publishing. For those who don't know, I've been following for quite some time now, and I'm very impressed with his individual content, not only what he offers for the self-improvement community, but for fitness as well, and the amazing interviews that he does with many jack guys in the streets. Calisthenics-based, real deal, raw, you guys are going to love what we're going to talk about today. So, welcome to the show. Sean. Yo, Alex, what's up, man? First of all, I want to thank you for um, giving me a shout out in one of your one of your videos. One of my subscribers, actually two of them told me, was like, yo, man, this kid named Alex shouted you out in, in his channel. And I was like, well, who is who? Send me the link. Send me the link. And then uh, they sent me the link. I reached out to you and we spoke and uh, here we go, man. Hey, I like what you're doing. <laughs> You keep it raw, 100 every single time. And what I really like about your channel is that you're not afraid to speak your mind. It's like you got nothing to lose. You're just letting it all in. And either people mess with you or they don't. Keep it up. And uh, now I want to start asking you some questions about, first of all, who is Sean G? Uh, can you give us a little introduction about your fitness journey specifically? And then later on, we can get more into the self-development stuff. So how old are you and how long have you been working out for? When did you start to really understand the process of properly training? Well, Sean G, man, I'm from Jersey, uh, born and raised in the United States, state of New Jersey, 52 years old. I work out six to seven days a week. All calisthenics. I don't lift no weights. Everything I do is calisthenics. I focus a lot on uh, Fit Over 50. I do a lot of videos, Fit Over 50. I started my YouTube channel back in 2018. I, I've been, I worked out pretty much my whole life, but I worked out wrong, and I didn't really find out that I was working out wrong until I got to federal prison in October of 2014. And that's where I saw how you supposed to work out, how you supposed to look, how you supposed to eat, how you supposed to sleep, how you supposed to take naps, how you supposed to discipline yourself, how you supposed to concentrate and you know, how you're supposed to work out two, three, four times a day. And um, that's when I really learned how to really get down when it came down to working out. Yeah. So it was in prison where everything was revealed to you. And so what are some of the significant differences that you see in there versus the free world? Because there's a lot of talk about science-based training and what we do over here is very different from what I've seen because in 2020, when global events happened, there were a lot of people coming out with their prisoner style workouts. There was the down sessions, there was the ladders, and it was all calisthenics, high volume, but like really high reps, 500 to 1,000 rep push-up workouts minimum, and just getting reps in. And it's not usually difficult variations either. It's just pumping, right? And a lot of time and attention based stuff. So can you speak a little bit more about the differences between prisoner style workouts versus what's more commonly prescribed? Listen, man, before I went to the joint, man, I was always taught you do bench three sets of 10, you do squats three sets of 10, and you know, three sets of 10. And if you were really getting down, it was like four sets of 10. When I got in there, man, we was doing 10 sets of everything, man, bench, squats, whatever weight. And I, there was weights where I was at. I was at FCI Morgantown, Federal Correction Institution, Morgantown, in Morgantown, West Virginia. So we had a weight pile outside, right, in West Virginia. So if it was goddamn 108, we worked out outside. And if it was eight degrees, we worked out outside 365 days a year. But I remember me and my man, Mr. Man, we would do bench on Sundays. We called it National Heavy Day. We would do like maybe 13 sets of bench, man. You know, and just 
I mean, it, it, it was something I had never seen before, Alex. I had never seen nobody train like that. And then um, it just really shot out, you know, shot in the head the notion of overtraining. Because I, I saw dudes work out two, three times a day for 358 days. And then they would take seven days off the last week for 365 days. And then they would start the process all over again. And I'm talking about knots, lumps, cuts, everything, man. And um, yeah, like you say, man, I remember we did a thousand push-ups. Me and this dude did a thousand push-ups in 40 minutes. You know, 300, 300 push-ups, 200 push-ups wasn't even, I mean, that we ain't, what is that? I'm not doing two. Let's do 400. You know, let's do 500. You know, that's that's what we did. We used to do 500 push-ups every day, Monday to Thursday. And then do like a thousand reps of abs right after that. They right. go to wait. It was crazy, man. And a lot of people online seem to think that's over-exaggerating. But it's not. Because you have uh, this is real, <laughs> the real man. ex-cons who did man, show up on YouTube. Real, and you see them doing these workouts. Like one of the people... Um, Problem Child Fitness, he did a thousand push ups in uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. And there's many others that have done the same thing. So, this isn't some freak thing that you're talking about. It, it is real. And people train year round like this. So, when you see this in there, um, first of all, do these guys maintain that physique when they get out? And how do you look like now compared to back then when you were in that environment? And also, how does the environment play a role in your mentality of working out? Because I've often heard that your life is on the line. So it's not, for example, when you do your burpees, the cardio serves a purpose, right? It's not just about being ripped up. You're getting ready for war. So how true is that aspect? I don't know what it was, man. You know, it's a mentality because you around a bunch of dudes all day, man. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no cell phone. I mean, dudes got cell phones in there. But there's no cars. There's no watch. There's no, you know... There's no women, you're not getting, you know what I'm saying? You're not getting no pussy, you know what I'm saying? You're not distracted. You, 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 everybody's frustrated. People want to go home. People are depressed. And you round 1,100 dudes all day, right? And I saw my mind elevate to a level that I had never gone before, you know, as a result of this. And nobody cares. Whether you live or die, nobody cares. You have to care. Everybody is working out with, well, let's say the majority, because you got some dudes that don't work out. They just sit in there and get fat. I was afraid. You're constantly on edge. There's things going on. So, you know, it's about it's about being ready. If everybody else is getting ready, then I'm going to get ready, you know. And it's funny you said that about the burpees, because I remember when I had started to try to lose weight. Because I, I always kept like a little gut. And um, I was asking my man, this kid from Kentucky, I was like, yo, how you get ripped up? And he was like, burpees. And he said that he would do them, you know, in case you get into a knife fight, you want to be able to last. You want your gas tank to be, you want to be able to last. You don't want to run out of gas in the fight, you know. And that was primarily the main reason for, 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 for burpees. You know, the mentality is all testosterone. It's all testosterone. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And you can work out more because you really don't have anything to do other than your own self-development, your own self-improvement, and your ability to take naps, right? So if you working out, I don't care what kind of workout you're doing, you can take all the supplements in the world. If you ain't getting seven, eight hours of sleep every night, you ain't finna see no gains, man. And if you really wanna see some gains, try to squeeze you in a 25 minute nap in the middle of the day, if you can afford it, a 30 minute, then you could get back up and go work out again with the same intensity that you worked out before you took that nap. And that's why dudes come out of there looking like that, like they've been preserved, man. Like they've been yeah. in a jar. You know what I'm saying? I'm 52. You know what I'm saying? I'm right, man. I'm 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 right. I don't take no steroids, no creatine, 
No supplement. I don't take nothing, man. I don't take nothing. And I work out with anybody, anybody, anybody. I don't care. Because my mentality was, you know, in, in there, you, you know what I'm saying? You you might be in a car because you, you had to work out. You you couldn't just go, you know how like you go to the gym now and you could grab a dumbbell, you could grab a, a, a bar, or I'm gonna get this bench. No, 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 no. In the joint, first of all, you got to get into a car. You got to get into a group. So if you, where are you from, Alex? I'm from Montreal, Canada. All right, so it'll be some dudes. It'll be the Montreal car. It might be six of y'all, right? Or it might be 12 of y'all broken down into three cars, four dudes apiece. So you're going to work out with the Montreal dudes. You're not going to work out with the Toronto dudes. And you have to ask them if you can work out with them, first of all. Mm -hmm. They may be like, nah, you understand? So that means you can't even go to the weight pile because you got to go with somebody. So what happens if you're alone? Because there is a lot of racial tension, right? And division as a whole. So do you literally have to join one of these clubs, if you will? Like what happens if you decide to go your own way? Are there going to be punishments for that? If if you, it's, it's, it's rare. The only time you really could go out to the weight pit and grab some weight is if it was thin, meaning there was not a lot of people there. You, you could go in there and you could do your thing. But like during the day, Monday through Friday, everything was accounted for. This bench is for the Pittsburgh car. They got it from 12 to 1. Then at 1 o'clock, Cleveland got it from 1 to 2. Then after 2 o'clock, then D.C. got it from 2 to 3. Then Detroit got it. So everything was accounted for. You know what I'm saying? And you just couldn't go out there right? and just be grabbing weight, you understand? You, unless you wanted to get into it with somebody, because that's precisely what was going to happen. Okay, so it's highly structured in that way. You, you can't just freestyle it. There's, there's a, a rhythm to it, too. And from what I've heard as well, um, with the classic around the world workout, either you follow with the pace or you don't, right? Like you'll get dropped out of the routine. Listen, I'm 52, right? But I'm money. I'm 52, right? But I'm money, right? So if I'm working out with the Jersey, the New York car, and it's three 22-year-old dudes in there, I'm expected at 52 to keep up, right? It ain't no, yo, slow down, hold up, because now right. things going to be out the car. You fucking up our workout. You you know, we you too much of a distraction. Get up out of here. So it, that's... That's the attitude, and then I got that attitude today. I don't care what park I go into. I don't care. Yeah. Where, bro, they working out. I'm with it. What's up? Exactly. Let's go. Who go? Yeah. You know? So, so then two things about that. Would you say that being in that environment is what makes you this way now in terms of being able to keep up with the younger dudes? Because I see you go out in these Calsunks parks, and you're working out with them, and you're doing great, right? So there's that aspect. Then the second question would be. In there, do the older guys look just as good as the younger dudes? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, the dudes that's been, if they've been down 10, 15 years, you got to see some of these guys, man. Yeah. Their 50s ripped up and their 40s ripped up. You know, it's a mentality, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the first one to tap out. You know, I'm not. Right. I'm not going, y'all not, you know what I'm saying? I'm Because then the word will get around like, oh, yo, you don't work out with him. He weak, you know what I'm saying? Or he he gonna mess up the routine, then nobody gonna want to work out with you. Wow. So there's a big uh, respect and status element to this as well. Well, there's an the ego. There's a big ego thing. Ego. And okay. there's a big arrogance, a big pride, and a big uh, self confidence thing that mm -hmm. goes with working out in prison. What do you say to all the people who believe that going there is cool? Because you hear a lot about the rap songs and they're, you know, they're describing it like you got street cred for one, but also making it seem like this was the best thing that ever happened to them. And I'm sure that you do grow a lot through the suffering, but how is it really? I know you described the feelings of anxiety and always being on the edge, but those who say that it's cool to be there, what, are your, what is your response to that? Well, man, these are, these are obviously young dudes who are influenced by stupid ass rappers who are also young dudes 
who have probably never been there. Uh, there's nothing cool about prison. I was away from my son for 16 months. I didn't know if anybody was, I didn't know if anybody was sticking their finger in his booty, molesting them, and I couldn't do anything to protect them because I was locked away. So what's cool about that? You know, your mother dies, your sister dies, things happen, and you're not there to be a participant in your own life. So ain't nothing, ain't nothing cool about it. You know, I put myself there. It was my fault. It was my mistake. I didn't blame nobody. Um, but what I did was I turned FCI Morgantown into a university. And uh, I turned it into a college campus in my mind. And I came out better than what I was when I went out, when I got there. Right. So you knew that, first of all, you took accountability for your actions. And you being away from your son, which was probably the biggest factor in all this, knowing that he was out there alone and you're stuck in here. I'm sure that is what kept you going and wanted you to better yourself and enhance those around you as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I had made a mistake, man. I made a mistake. I lost a million dollar net worth, 1.2 million. I had, I had a $400,000 a year income. I was a licensed real estate broker. I had nine rental properties that brought me in 8,000 a month and I had blew up my life. I had lost it all, man. And when I looked up, I was down to three thousand dollars from having nine hundred and sixty-five thousand cash, and uh, you know I was then I had to turn around and go to prison, you know, and and I was in a depression for like three and a half years before I went in, and uh, you know they wanted me to cooperate and be a rat, stay out of prison, but that ain't nothing that I do. You understand? I don't get down like that, you know. So I stood on my square, I rubbed it on my chest, and I went in like a man, and I came out like a man. You understand? And, I came right back to the neighborhood where I live and I could walk around and have to worry about nobody doing nothing to me because, you know what I'm saying? I stood on my square. It changed me and it turned me into a, it turned me into a, you know, to a monster, man. A psychological, a mental monster. Well, you know, I, I went in at 45, I came out at 47, so it ain't no excuses. Right. I've, I've seen a lot of interviews where Ex-cons describe how they're permanently affected like this. They feel as if they are animals that are constantly caged and they have a difficult time adapting to the modern world. Um, and many fall into depression as a result or resort to drugs. And what I would like to know is, first of all, were there any turning points in your life while you were going through all this turmoil that make you say, no, never again. I'm, I'm gonna get through this and I'm gonna come out a better man. And then how does one keep going after the fact? When I got out, I was only in there for a brief time, right? But you're forever spiritually and psychologically scarred by that experience. And when I went in, before I went in, I was a millionaire. When I came out, I had $1,900 to my name. I was homeless living in somebody's basement with my son. And, uh, after the pink cloud of getting released first, then a depression set in that, yo, I had to start all over again. So what I did as a, for some therapy and what was therapeutic to me, I began to write. Mm -hmm. And I wrote these three books right here, Stigmatism in My Soul. You can get them on my website, gumbypublishing.bigcartel.com. And what that did was it was therapeutic for me to write about my thoughts, my feelings, and how I felt. And that relieved a lot of the stress. But, you know, it is different. Free society versus what goes on in there. It's a whole different set of rules. Um, but the turning point for me uh, was when my mother and my son came to visit me after I had been in about eight months. That was the only visit I got. And I remember they came to visit me on a Saturday and a Sunday. And I remember my mother getting up and saying, all right, we getting ready to go. We getting ready to go, Patrick gotta take us back. My man Patrick brought them to see me. And when she told me she was getting ready to leave and I looked at my son and I looked at her and that's, I knew that they were leaving and I had to go back. I couldn't finish the visit. And I told her, I said, yo, I got to go to the bathroom. And I went in the bathroom. My eyes were watery. And I said, yo, Sean, you got to get it together, man. You can't go back into this visiting room with these inmates and let them see you crying. And you can't 
walk back across this compound, and let you know. So I went in the bathroom, I straightened up, and I couldn't even go back, Alex, and say goodbye. So I just walked back to the unit, and I slept for like three hours, man, you know, just fatigued, because I used to see how dudes would go to visits and come back and go right to sleep, mm. and I never understood it. But it's just the emotional and the psychological and spiritual fatigue of seeing the people you love and you can't go. And that was when I turned and I said, I said, uh, I said, nah, I said, this is it. You know what I'm saying? I was already on, I was already money at that point, but I got even more money after that. I got even more focus and, and um, so that was a, that was a turning point for me, man. Yeah. That's deep stuff, Sean. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that information with me and with the audience because people don't realize how bad it really is until you hear it straight from someone who had to suffer. And now I want to get away from this topic and get into more <laughs> what was going to be the main thing of today's talk, which is and whatever you, you want know. to talk about, man. Let's get there. Alex, tell the people yeah. that this ain't tell them that this is unscripted. This is you didn't you didn't tell me what the, you were going to ask me. Make sure you no. let them. That's right. This is 100% raw, guys. We're just, we're vibing it out. And this is what it is. And I don't do scripted. I don't do scripted. My life is an open book. And I appreciate that. And, and people could see that if they watch your videos. It's very clear. Anyway, let's talk about your working out experience. So you started in what, 2014? Getting really serious? I got there October 2014. And when I saw the way these. This worked out the white boys, the Spanish boys, the Asian. I said, this is this is this is some NFL. This is above NFL. All of them were ripped up. Everybody. Some wanted to get super swole, but other ones wanted to just get lean and ripped with four percent body fat or seven percent body. You know, everybody had their own individual goals, but but everybody was everybody. There was no talking. There wasn't no talking in the weight pit, man. Other than with your crew, wasn't no none of that checking your phone or all. That. It was just let's get down because we only got this thing for an hour. Let's get money. I saw dudes with abs and I never had abs. And everybody used to say, "Yo, Sean, you fat, you fat. You know, you look like a boiled egg with legs." But then <laughs> I, I I didn't like that, so I started to work on my abs, doing more burpees and stuff like that. So when I'm focused and getting down. My body transformed like that. You look healthy. And Thank you. Can, you, you, have, you have a good energy as well. Yeah. So things came good for you. Um, and I think that's also important that people need to stop comparing themselves to other men. Because... Tell them, Alex. We, guys, you got to stop comparing yourself to other men. Be the best Tell version them. of you. Uh, you. You can't control what you were given from your parents. You just got to deal with it and... Get smarter with your training. Stay dedicated. Stay focused. It can take some time. It might be five, ten years. Who knows? But it's about not getting away from that process. You have to stay on it. The grind doesn't stop. No. And so it doesn't matter our starting point. It's what we're going to end up with, which may not be what you thought it was going to be, but it could still be absolutely amazing. That's a good point, man. I've been training. I got out of the joint in 16. It's 2022. I've been training for five years, street, street calisthenics. I did a little weights when I got out, but I let that go because I stayed injured all the time. So, and you got to be consistent. The results going to come over time. You're not going to get right in, in nine months, man. So stop that, man. Stop right. that. You, you know what I'm saying? Stop going on YouTube and this one and listen to that one. Yo, do this and that. Then, then you do this and do that. And, and your head, you, you, you all fucked up up here because you're listening to eight different things that don't work for you because you're different from the person you're listening to. Just work out and learn your body, man. That's it. And, it. and it takes time. It's as you say, like in the video that I'm going to be posting on my channel, everybody buys all these supplements because they want quick results. They're willing to put $500 on this stuff, Tell but me. they won't work out. And then 90 days later, they're wondering why they don't look the way they thought they were going to look. Well, because it takes more than that. Sure, you, you can you can lose weight in 90 days, put on some some good a decent amount of muscle and some strength, but it's not going to be a mind-boggling body transformation unless you already had something before that. So I want to get into the topic of calisthenics, right? That's what your channel's focus is about. You don't really cover weights, and well, except for maybe weighted calisthenics, right? Uh, like weighted yeah. pull-ups, weighted dips. Right. So 
besides the, the looking bulky thing that you described earlier, um, what really is it about body weight training that appeals to you? And do you see the value of it for the majority? I know you talk about it, but like, what would be the best comparison you'd make of weight training to calisthenics? Man, I went to prison at 45. I had never really saw dudes doing calisthenics until I got to prison and I saw everybody doing calisthenics and I saw how they look and where we worked out at after we did our weight training with the weights before you left the weight pile, you had to do some pull-ups or you had to do some dips, even if you did legs or back, mm -hmm. whatever. So it was an integral part of our workout. And then there was dudes that only did all calisthenics and they looked the best. That was where I was introduced and I fell in love with it. I don't get injured. You know, if I go super hard one day, I'm sore, but it's not like the sore you get with the weights, the way they beat you down. Um, but for me in my body, I'm just not into weights because more so because of my age at this point, right? Because I'm not willing to take supplements. I'm not willing to take steroids. I'm not willing to take TRT. I'm not willing to take human growth. I'm not willing to take nothing. So everything I'm getting money with is pure me. And I'm just, I don't like the way it just beat me down to the point where I don't even want to go work out the next day. But with calisthenics, I could get money every day and I still look good. I'm still agile. I'm still limber. I could not do calisthenics for two weeks. You understand? Don't really lose much. Get right back on the bar. And in four days, I'm, I'm right back. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's another psychological component to the calisthenics too, man, when it's just you and that bar mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I, I didn't really get with the weights, but I'm, I'm strictly, I'm strictly calisthenics but don't 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 let that fool you now if you want to get on the flat bench i'm a flat bench man you understand yeah. you can put 225 on there 250 on there and i don't even lift weights and i'm gonna get underneath it and i'm gonna hit it you yeah. understand yeah i had well, ran my bench up i had ran my bench up alex in the joint to 335 i was able to hit 315 for two and i was like 170 pounds and that's really good pound for pound strength yeah, that's uh, yeah, a lot of people will kill for that. And you did it with primarily body weight training. And what's crazy is that you're not the first to mention this. I've seen many people with amazing chests who do lots of push ups who can walk in, put up crazy numbers on the bench. It happens all the time. And they're usually not even doing crazy variations of the push up. You would think, oh, they're floating in the air doing planche push ups, but usually it's just high rep workouts and they got all this muscle and performance and the pound for pound is usually up there. They're, they're typically not the heaviest dudes. They're just ripped up and strong. So it's cool that you're confirming that as well. So uh, not only do you get carry over the weights, if you decide to go down that path, it keeps you preserved. So you don't have any stress in the joints, the longevity is maximized. And from what I've seen, a lot of guys in their 40s are already banged up. And you're at 52, only getting better, but it doesn't feel as if you're beat down. So I think that's a big point to raise that body weight training, just it's easily sustainable. And a lot of the guys you interview, similar age group, look phenomenal, still killing it. And that's something I've always noted that those who do calisthenics for years or decades at a time always look good as a, an older man and the calisthenics do can go to the gym and somewhat compete yeah on the weights level but a weights do can't come to the calisthenics part and compete no. on a rep level with the cal because that when i was hitting when i got to the joint i was hitting 325 on a max on my flat bench but i couldn't even do six pull-ups Oh, that was crazy. I couldn't do six pull-ups because I never did that. So you got a lot of dudes in the gym. They super strong, super yeah. big. You take them to the calisthenics park. They can't even give you eight pull-ups, man. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole uh, other strength, man. Yeah. And that has to do with um, closed chain versus open chain movements. So when you're moving your body 
through space, it seems to have better carryover to being fixed and pressing away from you or pulling away from you than the other way around. Crazy how that works out, but it's true. So um, in terms of muscle building, you keep it to the basics, right? Uh, primarily high volume pump style reps, but are there any advanced variations that you like to incorporate for further development, like using gymnastic rings or uh, specific stuff that just looks hard when you see it visually, one arm pull up, stuff like that? Nah, not me, man. All I'm doing, when I want to put on size, you understand, is I'm doing weighted, weighted cow, I'm doing weighted pull ups, okay. weighted dips, right? My push up game is already money. I'm not into all the other stuff, you know. I'm just straight sets and reps, push-ups, pull-ups, dips, squats, mm -hmm. burpees, right? Ab wheel, things like that. I don't get into all the other stuff. And as far as my muscle building, if I want to put on size, I up my protein. That's all you're going to talk. When you get to prison, that's all you're talking about, protein, protein. You know, I'm upping my protein to at least 100 uh, I'm I'm about 168 right about now. I'm up my protein intake to probably about 110 to 115 grams a day when I want to put on size, and I'm doing calisthenics every day. And in goddamn two three weeks, you can you can see it. That's when I'm mentally on that, but I'm really not on that. I'm in the, you know, I just want my body, my trap. I want that bedroom body. I want my abs to show a little bit. And I keep the protein, I keep the boiled eggs, the tuna, the sardines. You know, I just I'm just maintaining at 52 years old. But if I want to turn it up and get money, I can put it on. I know how to do it because I learned my body. Right. So it's more about the food, if anything. The working out comes naturally when you're recovering outside the calisthenics gym, basically. So where did the whole boiled egg and sardines thing come from? Uh, why that specifically instead of uh, gravitating towards bodybuilder type foods uh, or diets? And what about the plant-based stuff? Because a lot of the people you interview are on that. So would you consider going down that path? The boiled eggs and fish came from prison. Uh, the dudes that worked in the kitchen would go in the kitchen. They hustled because they wasn't getting no money sent in from their family, they had been in so long, their hustle was to boil 200 eggs in the kitchen when they went to work, steal them, take them out of the kitchen, take them back to the unit and sell them for five for a dollar, right? So as soon as they come back in the unit with the eggs, I say, give me 10, right? An egg has six grams of protein, branch chain amino acids, the yolk has got the vitamin A, I would get me 10 eggs, that's 60 grams of protein. Then I would buy the fish off the commissary, which was mackerels. They would come in a pack. It was like 19 grams of protein in a pack. So two eggs is 12, 19, 21 grams. I would eat like five. I would, I would, if you eat two of them, 38 grams, that's where I got the protein from. So Okay. Um, and, uh, do that every day? I would do that every day with almonds. You got protein and almonds. Um protein and milk. I was, a, I'm a milk drinker. We, we, I would get the milks, um, but any kind of protein, you know, we had chicken day was every Thursday. Everybody went the main line for chicken day. Cause the chickens got a lot of protein. Hummus got a lot of protein, yeah. cottage cheese. We ate a lot of cottage cheese, cottage cheese, got a lot of protein, low on carbs, low on sugar. So you're going to get the protein and you're going to still stay ripped up. And that's how I learned how to eat. So uh, what, what about the other things? The plant-based, the like plant-based, the plant-based, excuse me, I, I didn't mean to yeah. tell you, but the plant-based, I ain't doing none of that. I ain't doing yeah. none that. that ain't me. That ain't me. I eat meat, man. I eat meat and I look good. I ain't on no medication, no high blood pressure, no cholesterol, no none of that, no erectile dysfunction, no nothing. You understand? I don't eat for taste. I eat to live. I don't, I don't like the way um, hummus tastes, but I eat it. 
I don't like the way cottage cheese tastes, but I eat it. Oh, yeah. Additional value. You so, know? so a lot of these foods that you, you were talking about to build mass, you don't even enjoy it, but you have it anyway. Absolutely. Because it, it, it's what I need. It, I want If, if I want to be lean and ripped up, I want low sugars. Complex carbs are good, but the simple carbs I don't need. If I got to eat hummus and cottage cheese, I, I'm going to eat it. Okay. So that people... Pe you're, you're willing to suffer a bit for the sake of going through this transformation. And I think that's what a lot of people don't get. They think it's a walk in the park that you're going to be satisfied 100% of the time. But really, it sometimes it does suck a little bit. Maybe not too bad, but you just got to deal with it. Yeah, I, I don't eat. I've been stopped eating for taste, man. I, I eat to live, man. Massa. Hmm. I've been stopped doing that. I mean, I eat Skittles. I'm eating bad now. I eat Skittles, blow pop. I just had some Hagen Dazs ice cream the other day, or whatever. Yeah. I, so I, what's I, up I, with I, that, Sean? Huh? What's up with that? The man, Skittles. I still, and... Man, I still eat, but I'll fucking work out with anybody at the drop of a yeah. hat. You call me out. You better be ready, cause I'm coming. That ice cream and Skittles, that ain't gonna mean nothing. You're gonna burn it off. Man, that ain't gonna mean nothing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish the routine, and I'm, you know, what I'm saying I'm not gonna let you beat me, man. So yes. and see, even in there. Even in there, they sold ice cream on the on the uh, we ate ice cream in there on the commissary. You had to eat it as soon as you got it because we didn't have no refrigerator. But dudes ate honey buns. But you, if you active, you are gonna burn that off. I've seen that a lot in the calisthenics community. You burn so many calories, and a lot of these dudes eat junk food every day, but they're ripped up because they're they're training every day, so they burn off what they consume. And a lot of them don't do regular cardio either. It's just all the reps, you know? Yeah. And uh, even when your interviews, some of these people, they're talking about how they have hamburgers and donuts and, and cakes and pizza, all this stuff. And you look at them, you're like, what? You know? But uh, I guess you could outwork the diet to a certain extent. But imagine if they did things right. That's a crazy thought. Yeah. Okay, going back to prison again, right? It, they serve donuts and refined carbs sugary foods things that aren't good for you would you not eat that if it was offered to you if you just eat it or you put it aside like th those with the best physiques they still eat that stuff knowing that they could burn it off no 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 it depends on how dedicated you were um when i first got there i was buying sodas and milky way bars and three musketeers off the commissary and then when we would go to mainline to eat dinner and lunch, I would get the Kool-Aid because we had a fountain Kool-Aid thing. And when I talked to my man about how to get ripped up, he says, you start eating water, drinking water with every meal. You got to let go of the sodas. You got to let go of the, the the cakes, the pies, the honey buns. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the Milky Ways and the Three Musketeers. And then that's when I learned my body because when I let go of the simple carbs, and I upped my almonds and I upped my peanut butter and I upped my oatmeal and I upped my fish and I upped my eggs. I just saw my body just transform. I saw my mind clear. I saw my hearing get better. My vision get clear. My sleep get better. It was like a total, total transformation. Uh, but now nah, the dudes that's really on it, they not, they not eating none of that stuff. But interesting. You know, it everybody's got a different metabolism. That's why you can't listen to me. You know, you could watch Alex. Alex got the dope body, but Alex is Alex. You got to find out for you. Take seven months, eight months to learn yourself and your body. Let me stop drinking soda. Let me see what my body do. Right? Let me let me stop let me stop eating beef and see what my body do. And once you learn that, you can figure out how you want your body to look. Man. Right, so it's a it's a substitution method. You cut out a little thing, a few things here and there, and you see how it makes you feel. And you got to stop looking to everybody else for the answer. Sometimes they're already within you. I want to ask, how does one further develop their self confidence? What what are specific strategies they can incorporate? You know, besides solitude, <laughs> that elevate the mindset to that next level. Man, listen, I offer. One on one FaceTime mentorship sessions through my Patreon channel. 
Patreon channel with Soul. Or you can email me at the podcast with soul at Gmail or stigmatism in my soul at Gmail. And I can help you develop a relationship with yourself, help you to start to believe in yourself. I do a lot of that with my mentorship sessions, but you have to pay. So if you want to get into that, reach out to me. But you know some Alex, man, that's a dope question. Because after being 45 years old, a middle-aged man in America, black American male, descendants of the slaves, my mother picked cotton for 75 cents a day. My grandfather was a sharecropper in South Carolina. My mother was from Georgia. I had became a millionaire by the time I was 38, 39. I'm a recovering drug addict, recovering alcoholic, convicted felon. And I lost it all. At 45, I was in a depression so deep. And when you're down there and you realize nobody's coming to help you, that you have to help yourself, you reach down. I reached down into side of me and introduced myself to another Sean that I didn't know existed. And this happened in prison. I grew to believe, and I was around a bunch of other dudes because there is no, there's a lot of braggadocio in prison. There's a lot of arrogance. There's a lot of ego. There's a lot of conceit. There's a lot of uh, shit talking. Everybody's bragging about how they look, you know, there's not a lot of weakness there. So you, you can't stay there. And, you know, I began to believe again in myself in there. And I always had the reference points of my past accomplishments. Um, and, you know, first of all, you start with the little goal setting, right? I'm going to work out for the next five days in a row. I'm going to set this goal. I'm going to work out for five days in a row. It's a little small goal. But if you do that, that sets the tone. You say, hmm, I did that. I feel good about me. I could now let me do. And that's the beginning stages of goal setting. And then you just set them bigger and bigger. But you make your life what you want it to be. You understand? You, if you ain't shit, that's because you ain't doing shit. That's your choice. You understand? It's out here for everybody. And you got to believe, you know, childhood trauma is a huge, huge factor in a lot of people's depressions in their 20s and 30s. They got shit that happened to them when they were kids that they didn't deal with. Yeah. You're trying to cover it up with weed. They're trying to cover it up with drugs. They're trying to cover it up with sex. They're trying to cover it up with multiple women or multiple men, you know, instead of because they're scared of they, they, they don't want to deal with that. And they want to face it. Right. You got to do that, man. And and uh, I did all of this stuff, man. So, you know, you got to be confident, man. You got to believe in you. If, if you don't believe in you, ain't nobody else going to believe in you. Right. So you, you have more control than you realize. And one of the points you touched upon is that it wasn't your fault back then. When you were a child, you didn't know better. Uh, some things were just in your face. And you got to face that version of yourself. and not not get not beat yourself down over that you got to forgive it. that wasn't your fault if if you could have chose different parents you could have chose a different situation or if you could have stood up and fought and defended yourself you would have you were a kid right exactly yes all of those things are imprinted in your mind all of those things there was damage done to you yes there was damage done to sean right yes but when I become of age, once I get old enough and I notice, then it's my responsibility to fix it and not exactly. just be lamenting and, you know. Not victimizing I, yourself, you know. Right, right. Get your ass up. So what? You ain't the only one. There ain't no excuses. And don't nobody care. Don't nobody care. Nobody cares. Yeah. Now, now what you going to do? Exactly. Everybody's got to be honest with themselves. Uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And just stop making excuses. 
uh, recognize that we're not all that special. Sure, we have a unique genetic makeup. There will never be another person like you ever again. That's cool. But at the end of the day, we all go through some stuff. And the question is, what are you going to do about it moving forward? Are you just going to sit on the couch, allow yourself to get fat, complain about things that you had no control over? Or are you going to face yourself in the mirror and say, I'm going to do something about this? Alex, man, I talked to, through my channel, it's amazing. A lot of my followers are young dudes in their 20s because I gear a lot of my messages toward them. And I talked to a lot of young white European kids, young kids in South America, Spanish kids, young dudes in Africa, young kids in America, Canada supports me, Australia. Mm -hmm. And all of these kids are broken. You know, something happened. The story's always the same, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, where you from, what you look like, your nationality, your religion, none of that don't mean nothing, man. People are dealing with some serious, serious issues. You know, father, Sean, I didn't have a father. I get that all the time, talking to dudes in Russia, in the Ukraine, Romania, right. Italy, you know? So, you know, it, it, it's all over, man, but you gotta fix yourself, man. Yeah. You gotta fix yourself, man. It's, it's a crazy realization that a lot of us have these issues and we end up binding together. You know, we have that connection. It's internal. Yeah, it goes deep. This is, the, this is the spiritual work, man. And that's why I call my books Stigmatism in My Soul, man. I talk about, you got to buy my books, man. Stigmatism in I'd My Soul. I'd love to read your books, Sean. Don't get them off of Amazon. They're all on Amazon. But buy them from me. I'll sign them. I'll call you on the phone. And thank you. But this was spiritual surgery. You got to do the spiritual surgery. Spiritual surgery. You got to do the spiritual surgery and cut out the cancer inside of you that's killing you. That's having you running into these brick walls. You know, that's in, that's keeping you from being in a productive, healthy relationship with a woman. Right. That's that's keeping you from succeeding. That shit is inside of you. Something happened and it's OK. Then besides your books, uh, because you had to get to a certain point in your life to have this wisdom to write it down. What are some influential writings or people you've had that change your perspective about various problems and ways of developing yourself even more? Uh, like, would you have a top three to five book recommendation besides man, yours? You got to get As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Classic. I've been reading that book for about 30 years, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Edward Lefevre about the lives and times of Jesse Livermore. I read that book, The Count of Monte Cristo, Alexander Dumas. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a voracious reader, man. I, I, I love to read. Uh, that's what I do. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual. I'm a scholar. That's what I pride myself on. Like I say, I got a bachelor's degree in accounting, a master's in finance. I've always loved to read. You know, my drug addiction in the 80s, you know, you learn a lot from your pain. Right. Pain is a motivator and it should be a teacher. But those are some of the books, man. Okay. Do you listen to audiobooks as well? Like when you're driving? Man, I'm a reader, man. I'm a reader. Just man. reading. I'm old school, man. I sit down and read. <laughs> yeah. It's a form of meditation as well, right? Because it clears your mind and you're fully focused on it. You're just, you know, going through the pages. And then next thing you know, an hour passed by and you've absorbed all this information. Without a doubt, it's quiet. I was coming here, I turn everything off and I open up a book and it just calms my spirit, it calms me down, calms my mind. That's really cool, Sean. And a lot of successful people read books. It's, it's one of the most common things you see. So uh, besides those recommendations, what about influential men that have made an impact on you? Like any public figures specifically? No, nah, not really, man. Not really, eh? So it's the books and life experience. Just yeah. going through things. Yeah, yeah. Muhammad Ali, you know. Muhammad Ali, yeah. Muhammad Ali, man, I mean, you want masculinity, man. Real manhood, which isn't prevalent today. I mean, my man stood on his square, man, and looked at the most powerful governor in the world, says, nah, I'm not going over there. Fight and he didn't go. 
yeah, but you're going to lose all of this money. You're going to lose everything. You're not going to see no action. You're just going to do exhibition, man. I ain't going. I ain't going. And he didn't go. And history vindicated him. And he was always respected as a man. Masculinity. Right. Masculinity. The, the ability to stand your ground and uh, what you not believe. deviate away from what you know is right. Stand and believe what you believe in. Nobody speaks up today. The fear of judgment is too high. And they don't want to give up everything. This man gave it all up. And he got it all back. And he goes down in history. YouTube shut down. I mean, uh, ESPN did three days. It was all him for three days in a row. Well, that's why they say if you stand for what you believe in, uh, eventually you will prevail. Because if the message is the truth, you're going to get that respect. And it's going to come around in a positive way. So everything does happen for a reason. And sometimes your worst nightmare is your biggest blessing in disguise. That's it. That's it. You know, I, I never would have thought, man, I was weak, Alex. When I was a millionaire, I was fat. I had 1.2 million, my net worth. I was dealing with probably about six or seven women. I was borderline diabetic. I had high triglycerides, high cholesterol, high blood wow. pressure. You know, I had all of this money. I was fat. And I was weak. I was a weak man. I felt I used my money to purchase what I wanted. I purchased people. I purchased situations. And it took me to crash and burn and to end up with nothing. And I'm so thankful that the universe did what it did because my son was born 40 days after the feds came and served me with my search warrant. So it was like God told me, Sean, I'm taking all of this material shit and I'm going to give you Mm. this baby that's got your same name, that looks like you, that got your blood. Because I think it knew that if it would have kept me with the money with the baby, I I wouldn't have been able to give him anything other than material shit. There there had to be a trade-off and you you needed to experience the extreme to realize what you had. When you say it's me and little Sean against the world. What, what does that mean, Sean? Man, listen, listen, man. I, was, I ain't scared of nobody. I'm not afraid of no situation. I'm not afraid of no circumstance. I don't care what your title is. Put it up. Let's go. You know, and I speak life into Sean. He's 10 years old. I speak life into him. You know what I'm saying? I speak life into myself. I'm my biggest fan. The biggest, the the the, the longest conversation that you're gonna have today, and I'm talking to you who watching is the one you're gonna have with yourself. If you tell yourself you ain't shit all day, then guess what? That's what you're gonna be. You ain't gonna be shit. But if you turn around and tell yourself that you all of that, that you the best and that you could do it no matter what, then that's the way you're gonna walk around and you're gonna the results are gonna prove that. I'm not of that ilk, be meek, the meek shall inherit the earl. Nah, nah, that don't really work too well. The universe favors the bold. The universe favors the aggressive. The weak ain't got nothing coming but hard times. History's reflected that. The strong, he gonna be all right. He gonna be all right, but he still has to live, in my opinion, according to the laws of the universe, the sun, moon, and stars, because the universe will, will break its back. You never get out of line and be thinking that you greater than the universe, in my opinion. This is also where working out gives you that mind-body connection, yeah? Um, It develops a greater sense of self. And you know that the lessons you acquired in building that physique can be applied to other aspects of your life. Tell them, Alex. Tell them. Tell them, man. It's, It's a lifestyle. This is something you do every day from the nutrition to the training to the feelings you get. You don't want to work out. You feel down that day, but you go for it regardless. The mental game. That's what this is really about. It's not, them, it's not about the aesthetics, even though that's a beautiful uh, side effect. Tell them. And like you said, it carries over to other areas of your life. You're an entrepreneur. 
what do you sell? You sell apples. All right. So then now you're going to be the best apple seller because you're going to set these goals because you set them in your workout and your personal life. It's going to carry over to that. You know, you're a web designer or graphic designer. You're going to carry over to that. You know, it's all, all, all related, man. And it's all inside. The discipline and lessons are pretty much universal. And one of the things you're always talking about is it never stops. No, I'm never going to let you see me stop. I'm going to watch you stop first so then I know I beat you. And then you see me still going when you stop. And it's in your mind that he kept going after I stopped. He better than me. Now I got the edge. Might is right. I got to keep that mental edge. I got to keep that mental edge within me. And I want you to know. I want both of us to know what it is. You know, uh, David Goggins calls that taking souls. You can see right. the life being sucked out of the dude's eyes, you know, and in, in some ways that can motivate them to pick the ass back up. Exactly. 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 You know, I talk a lot of shit to my subscribers on my channel and I sometimes I just go on rants. But really, in a subtle way, it's trying to get them to like, yo, Sean ain't going to keep talking to me like this, man. Let me get up and, and do something. Right, man. right. You know, let me, he not going to keep talking. Because that's what it was with me. Because when I got the prison see, yeah, nigga, but you look like a boiled egg with legs. You strong. You can hit 335 on the bench, but look at how you look. And I would look and be like, damn, my God. And I would go in the mirror. I'd be like, nah, man, we're not going to have this. I'm going to get yeah. this shit. It pushed me to get to where they was at. So then I would go around and take my shirt off like, yeah, now what? Now what? Exactly. Now I bitch more than you and I look better. It was constant competition. It was constant Constant, it never stopped the competition, man. Never Com stopped. Competition brings the best out of men. And when when they say comments like that, it's not to bully, it's it's tough love, straight up. And we men. We men. Yeah, we don't have to get offended. You wanna you know? go, but you can get offended. I don't care. I'm still gonna say what I got to say. You understand? <laughs> I'm still gonna say what I got to say. Right. But but we we men, man. We 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 men. Y'all gotta turn the TV off, turn social media off, stop hanging around your mother, your aunt, your grandmother, your sister. You hanging around all these women, right? And you gotta go hang out with some dudes, man. Should that be the default on a daily basis? Like you wanna work out with other people, you you wanna have a like a social event that you regularly attend. Is it important to have groups? I'm a loner. I be by myself. I don't hang with nobody. I don't be lonely. I just be alone. Mm -hmm. But I work out harder and I work out better when I go to a park in the Bronx or the Harlem or Brooklyn or Newark or just, and there's a bunch of dudes working out. Eight dudes. We all, now I'm locked in because I'm not going to be, because everybody size, we, everybody size everybody up. Stop that. Yes, we do. Every you go to the gym, everybody's looking. You sizing this dude up. Oh, I can bench that. I can do. I can squat that. So when I'm in the park with a bunch of dudes, I'm I'm getting money. I ain't. I don't want to talk. My form is clean. I'm getting clean reps. Then when I go by myself and I work out by myself, then I don't go as hard. I get mm -hmm. my money. So, but it's that masculine energy. It's right. that competition we're talking about. You understand? I'm finna show you what I can do. I see what you do. I'm slow. I'm not staring, but I'm watching. I, I get a quick peek and I look and I, you know. Hmm. Yeah. And in the calisthenics parks, um, is the same people that usually show up at similar times and everything? Yeah. People are dedicated, man. But what's cool about this area, New York, New Jersey area, is that you're going to meet different people. Every park you go to is different people, different times, you know, and... You know, some of these parks be full. You know, that's why I say park full. And everybody wow. everybody got their shirt off. You understand? Every, you know, every that's it's 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 just it's it's a, it pushes you. Pushes you. Wow. So do you ever go somewhere with your camera and it's like, ah, uh, I don't think I could film here today. I don't care who in there. I'm stepping to them, I'm asking them. But a lot of times now when I show up to these parks, they already know who I am. When I first hey. When I first started, nobody knew who I was, and I didn't know these people. These interviews are random. I don't know these people. These are random people I just met. 
you know, God, how, uh, when you turn on the camera, did you literally just meet them at that moment, or was it like ten at minutes before? Moment, at that moment, literally. <laughs> I go over to him, say, "Yo, man, I got a YouTube channel, man. I I go, to, I film random dudes in the park doing calisthenics. I want to put you on my channel. Can I get an interview?" All right, or they'd be like, "Nah." And when they say, "All right," I would do a test for the sound. Test, test, sound. Once the sound was up, beep, let's go. That's, that's how that went. That's, that's how it was. And, and you've gotten millions of views doing that. And people over really 20, love it. Over 21 million views. It's a lot of views, especially uh, for a channel of your size that's still growing, you know? And and YouTube shadow banned me for a year, too. So I, I, I really probably should have about 200,000 subscribers at this point. But they... Yeah. You know, I, I started shadow banning... Uh, comes from speaking your mind you know exactly. being real real but it's okay because you can always turn that around yeah as long as you got support and love from people they can't do anything to stop you right so sean i think we're gonna start wrapping up i want to ask you the ultimate question okay let's do it is sean g's life already written by Howard power supreme being and there's nothing he can do to change it or does Sean G make his life what he wants it to be with his choices and decisions? I'm a, I'm a believer in free will. I could choose right now to get up out of this chair while this camera is rolling and run and dive out that window on my head. If I so decide, that would be my choice. And after I fall down and break my neck, I can't say, well you, well, you know, God wanted me to do that. So he wanted my neck to be broke. Because that's why. No, don't do that. Stop that. But I also know, Alex, as we've discussed and if we review this interview and listen to certain parts of my life, there are times where there is divine intervention and some moon stars have stepped in and punished me when I needed to be punished and saved and rescued me when I needed to be saved and rescued when I was running around in Harlem getting high in the 1980s, 87, 88, 89. So I'm going to say it's, 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 it's both, but my personality, my attitude, my mindset, my ego, my confidence, my arrogance, my conceit is going to put me more on the free will side. And, um, you know, I, I, I can make this thing what I want it to be. You know, nobody's gotten me here that I'm being interviewed by Alex, Alpha Destiny, premier YouTube channel. I'm only here because I got up off my ass at 47 years old, fresh out of prison. Couldn't get a job because I got a felony conviction, white collar, federal felony. Nobody would hire me, not even Wendy's, not even Gold's Gym. So I started a window cleaning business, started a YouTube channel, and here I go. This is my work. We play a huge part in our lives. I play a huge part in my life. But there are times when the universe steps in and slaps me upside my head or steps in and says, Sean, I'm going to pick you up and dust yourself off. Keep on moving. And that happens when you least expect it. That, that's what's allowed you to grow the most. And it's as you say, you did this yourself. The good and the bad, but the end result is something positive. And now you're able to bring that back to the community. So, Sean, Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you being vulnerable and talking about your experiences, helping out my audience, speaking for the greater good, providing your life and working out wisdom. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you. Maybe we can do a part two in the future. Let's do it. And if people want to find you, again, links will be in the description box, but would you have any final messages to say before we close off right now? Hey, yo, Alex, man, I want to thank you. This never would have happened if you never would have mentioned me in your video. 
I watch what you're doing. You keep doing what you're doing. You got that look. Keep inspiring. Um, thanks for having me on your show. I'll come back anytime you ever come to New York or New Jersey and I'm around. You call me. I'm taking you to the parks. We're going to get some videos in. Shout out to all your subscribers at Alpha Destiny, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't never quit. And always believe in yourself, man. Fuck what they say. Don't worry about what they say. The most important conversation you're going to have every day in your life is the one you have with yourself. Man, well said. The podcast was sold on YouTube. That's my podcast channel. Check me out. Shout out to Sean G. Check him out. You guys won't regret it. He's the real deal. Much love. Thank you again. We'll chat soon. Peace out. Peace.